Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Better Hearing webinar. Today, I am joined by Nicole Oldrati, who is our fourth year extern at the UNC Hearing and Communication Center. My name is Caitlin Whitson. I'm a faculty audiologist at UNC. The, the talk today was made with contributions from Anne Marie Egan, who was a past UNC student and now is an audiologist in her own practice outside of UNC. But today we're going to be talking about tinnitus management. We are a practice that serves adults and, and teenagers in the greater Chapel Hill area. We are umbrellaed within the UNC School of Medicine. So we are a faculty practice of doctors of audiology. We serve as a training clinic for the doctoral students who are studying audiology at UNC Chapel Hill. We work with adults doing hearing tests and tinnitus evaluations and vestibular evaluations. We work with hearing aids and hearing protection. With hearing aids, we work with all of the hearing aid manufacturers and we run on an unbundled or fee-for-service business model. We have three locations. Our main clinic is there in the picture in Chapel Hill and we have two satellite offices also in North Chapel Hill and Hillsboro. For any appointments or questions, our phone number and email is at the bottom of the screen there. Our YouTube channel is listed there, although it's kind of a long link. So if you find us on Facebook, which may be easier to type in the URL, then you can link to our YouTube channel. Please subscribe because this talk will be posted there as well as future and past Better Hearing webinars. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you've already found us. So please hit the subscribe button and like this video. So tinnitus is kind of a big topic. We could really spend an entire semester in class for multiple hours a week talking just about tinnitus and learning about it. But today we only have about 30 to 45 minutes, so we are going to try to get through as much as possible. There is a lot we don't know about tinnitus still, and some of what we know is still theoretical because there's not a great way to directly measure tinnitus since it happens in the brain. But our goal today is to work on demystifying the topic of tinnitus, talk about what it is, and learn how we can treat it. So this is an outline of what we will be going through today. Tinnitus is derived from the Latin word tenere, which means to ring, and it is pronounced tinnitus and not tinnitus because it's not an inflammation, an itis, it is tinnitus. And it is any sound that's perceived by a listener that's not originating from an outside or external sound source. So it's happening within the body. It might be in one or both ears, or it might be constantly there, it might be intermittent, come and go. It can vary in volume, quality, description, and pitch. And it might be acute or it might be a chronic problem. So it can vary widely depending on the person. What it sounds like can vary depending on the person as well. So some people will come in and say, oh yeah, I hear a cricket sound in my ears, or I hear a tone, high or low pitched, a pulsating sound. We classify all of those types of sounds as tinnitus. Tinnitus is quite prevalent in the US and everywhere in the world really. There are over 50 million adults in our country that experience tinnitus. And a survey in 2007 asked U.S. adults, have you had tinnitus lasting more than five minutes in the last year? And one in 10 of them responded yes. About 2 million adults report an extreme or debilitating tinnitus. And that bothersome and debilitating tinnitus can really start to affect sleep patterns, attention, mood, anxiety, depression, and mental distress. Bothersome tinnitus can very quickly turn into a functional impairment and it can negatively affect our quality of life. 
We tend to see the prevalence of tinnitus go up as we get older, and it peaks in about the sixth decade of life, so between the ages of 60 and 70. After the age of 70, the prevalence starts to decline, and researchers aren't entirely clear on why that decline happens after the age of 60. But anecdotally, I can say that I have seen many of my patients with tinnitus tell me that, oh, I didn't even realize I'm not noticing it anymore as they go beyond the age of 70. So sometimes it can spontaneously get better, and we don't always know why. Now, there are two types of tinnitus. Subjective tinnitus is the kind where it's a sound perceived that nobody else can hear or measure, and it's usually described as sounding like a ringing, roaring, a tone, hum, whistle, music, etc. This is the most common type by far of tinnitus, um, covering about 99% of cases. Objective tinnitus, on the other hand, is a sound that can be heard or measured by an outside source or person, but the sound source is originating inside someone's body. So this might sound like a clicking, pulsating, or whooshing. And examples of sources of objective tinnitus may be blood flow that's going, an artery is very close to the middle ear, and that person can actually hear their blood flowing, or they might hear their own heartbeat. It might be myoclonic, which means there's a muscle spasm that's happening near the middle ear, which resonates, and you can hear it as a clicking. But these are more rare. Today, we're going to be focusing on subjective tinnitus, since that's by far the more common type. So tinnitus is a sound that we hear in the absence of other sounds. So just like a candle in a dark room, tinnitus tends to be more noticeable when it's quiet. But like the candle, when we turn on the lights, it tends to be less noticeable when we're surrounded by other sounds in our environment. As we go on in today's talk, you'll start to appreciate and understand why that is. It's really important to keep in mind that tinnitus is not a disease itself. It's a symptom from an underlying cause. So I'll say that again, tinnitus is not a disease itself. It's a symptom of an underlying cause. And in most cases, tinnitus is a symptom from damage from the inner ear with or without clinical signs of hearing loss. And what I mean by clinical signs is noticing you're having trouble hearing. But tinnitus may be a first warning sign that some damage has occurred in the ear and hearing loss may be coming years down the line, um, especially when that person has a history of noise exposure. So when we think about tinnitus treatment, we wanna think about it in the context of treating the underlying cause. So if we use an example from our friends in dentistry, would you treat tooth pain by treating the tooth pain <laughs> by taking painkillers for the rest of your life? Probably not, or for as long as the tooth pain lasts. No, because we know that the tooth pain is not the condition, it's a symptom. The actual cause is probably a cavity. So you wanna go in and have your cavity treated so that you can then thereby treat the symptom of tooth pain. So in this analogy, tinnitus is the tooth pain and we need to treat the cause. And the cavity in this case with tinnitus is typically hearing loss or damage to the inner ear. In fact, Almost 90% of people with tinnitus also have hearing loss, and it's debated in the literature if that last 10% also have underlying hearing loss that's not detected on testing or by the person. So a lot of tinnitus management is thought of in the realm of treating hearing loss or treating damage to the inner ears. So the top two causes of hearing loss are age-related hearing loss or presbycusis. Now this is usually bilateral or affecting both ears 
And with age-related hearing loss, we tend to lose our high-frequency hearing above 6,000 hertz uh, around the age of 65 and on. With noise-induced hearing loss, this is usually bilateral, but sometimes it can be unilateral, especially if there's a history of shooting firearms by that person. So when you shoot firearms, you tend to have one ear down and the other is more exposed. And so sometimes that can get more of the brunt of the blast from the firearm and sustains more damage. So with noise-induced hearing loss, we tend to lose hearing in the frequencies between three and 6,000 hertz. So both are affecting high frequencies, but have a slightly different pattern to them. Now, to understand where tinnitus is coming from in relation to hearing loss, we need to understand how hearing works. So we have this diagram of the ears and the auditory pathways as it travels up to the brain. So sound waves go in our outer ear. If we follow that red arrow in, comes to point A in the middle ear, and then sound passes through the bones in our middle ear and into the cochlea, which is labeled B on that diagram. The cochlea is a little shell-shaped organ that sound travels through. And within the cochlea, there are little tiny hair cells all over. And these are microscopic. There are millions of them. Those hair cells move in response to sound passing through. They essentially grab the sound and send it up the nerve to the brain where we hear. Each hair cell is tuned to a different frequency. And when it takes the sound, it's passing across a nerve synapse to go up the nerve fiber to the brain. When we have hearing loss, there may be damaged hair cells that are missing entirely or they're flopped over. They're not picking up the sound the way they should or they may not be picking it up at all. And in that case, the sound is not being received by the nerve and it's not being sent to the brain. And so then we get hearing loss. If we have a lot of damaged hair cells or nerve fibers in the inner ear, it eventually leads to hearing loss. And sorry, I'm letting some people in the meeting. Uh, it eventually leads to hearing loss if we have enough damage and people will start to notice speech is not as clear. I'm having trouble in background noise. I'm turning the TV up more than I used to. And maybe I'm having tinnitus too. And so then those people usually come in for help. Now, maybe you're not at that point where you, it's sustained that much damage yet. And some people may only have tinnitus, but not notice any trouble hearing. And it's theorized that that may be due to something called a hidden hearing loss. This is also called cochlear synaptopathy in the literature. And essentially you have your hair cell here taking in the sound. Now it's passing the sound through the cell and across the nerve synapse to the nerve fiber, which goes up to the brain. If we have noise exposure specifically, sometimes we lose these synapses. Often we lose these synapses that connect the cell to the nerve. When we lose these synapses, the nerve fiber will degenerate because there's no more live connection to the cell. And so the hair cells may still be pulling in the sound, but now it's got nowhere to go in some places. May not be enough damage to notice trouble with speech or hearing in general, but since the brain is not getting the complete sound that it used to, when it's missing a sound, it starts to generate its own. And that's when we get here, or when we get tinnitus, excuse me. So some of the first signs that someone has this cochlear synaptopathy is that they may or may not have tinnitus in one or both ears, and they may or may not have difficulty understanding speech and background noise specifically, or speech with multiple talkers. And this is a nice picture of a nerve synapse here. <laughs> So that brings me to our discussion on neural hyperactivity theory and tinnitus. So when we have this loss of hair cells 
or nerve synapses and nerve fibers in the inner ear, the brain is not getting that sound. So when we have sound coming into the cochlea, this is an example of our shell-shaped cochlea, each hair cell that runs along it is tuned to a different frequency, as I mentioned before. So we have the treble range at the beginning, and as we spiral up, it gets lower and lower in frequency. As those hair cell fibers pull sound from the cochlea, it sends it up the nerve, which is also arranged by frequency. And when that sound from that specific nerve fiber gets up to the brain, it stays in the area of the brain that's corresponding to the same frequency. So when these nerves are firing in our auditory cortex, they're firing and the brain perceives it as a sound tuned to a specific frequency. Now, I mention all of this to say that when we stop receiving sound from the cochlea in the brain, nerves will fire spontaneously and nerves are always firing spontaneously at a certain rate, but when they stop receiving the sound they're supposed to get or the signal that they're supposed to get, in some people, this can activate a hyperactive spontaneous neural firing in the auditory part of the brain. And because the auditory system is tuned to perceive this nerve firing as a specific frequency, we hear it as a sound, and that, and that is tinnitus. And this really goes hand in hand with our knowledge that when people come in with hearing loss, the pitch of their tinnitus often corresponds to the pitch where they have the most damage, and the damage is occurring typically in the cochlea if, if it's a noise exposure type of damage. Hyperacusis and tinnitus are two very common comorbidities. About 90% of people with hyperacusis or a sensitivity to loud sounds also have tinnitus. And so hyperacusis is a disorder that affects our loudness perception. And it means that sounds that would normally seem not too loud, more of a moderate level sound to someone with normal hearing, quote unquote, <laughs> could seem unbearably loud or even painful to someone with hyperacusis. And the th thought behind this is like tinnitus is this hyperactivity when there is no sound source present. Hyperacusis, on the other hand, is a hyperactivity in the auditory cortex to an external sound. So there's someone's talking, for example, and the sound goes in the ears and to the brain. And for whatever reason, the brain is over amplifying this signal. And to that person, it's perceived as too loud. So we've talked about a lot so far. So I'm gonna switch at this point and let Nicole talk to you about other causes of tinnitus. And she'll also go into some evidence-based treatment options. Now that we've talked about the anatomy side of tinnitus and, you know, connection between hearing loss and tinnitus, I want to switch gears and talk about some other reasons or causes that might be the reason you have tinnitus. So here's a list of medical causes of tinnitus. You may have wax or a foreign object of some kind in the ear canal. Um, you can have diseases that occur in the middle ear space where those three tiny bones are like ear infections or congestion, those could be at play causing tinnitus. You can have trauma to the head or the neck, sinus pressure, traumatic brain injury, temporomandibular joint disorder or TMJ may cause tinnitus as well, and potentially some ototoxic medications. There's a few more listed at the bottom, but if you have any questions or concerns specifically about your medication, and how they may relate to your tinnitus, please talk to your doctor before discontinuing any medications.
There's also information from the American Tinnitus Association on all the medications that could potentially cause or exasperate your tinnitus. You can go to ata.org and search for the medication list to go through the full list of medications. Now, of course, medications might not be the cause of your tinnitus at all. There are also a good amount of modifiable causes for tinnitus as well. The amount of caffeine or alcohol that you drink, if you smoke cigarettes or use tobacco, how much sleep you get at night, your anxiety level, your stress at work or in your lifestyle, any of these can cause or exasperate your tinnitus. And a lot of these modifiable causes can create a snowball effect. Maybe you didn't get a lot of sleep last night, so you drank an extra cup of coffee, but now it's the middle of the day and you're extra caffeinated, you didn't have a lot of sleep, and your tinnitus is blaring loud. It can easily and quickly become a very distressing situation. And stress and anxiety are big ones. Both of them can turn a mild case of tinnitus to a catastrophic case of tinnitus. And there's a connection between stress, anxiety, and tinnitus. Stress can affect a whole bunch of aspects pertaining to our bodies, from our immune system, to the circulatory system, to our mood, and everything in between. But right now I wanna focus on how stress affects your tinnitus. There's a neurophysiological model of tinnitus that describes the interactions between tinnitus, the brain, and our response emotionally. Tinnitus is generated in the auditory cortex due to the damage in the inner ear, like Dr. Whitson spoke about earlier, and that signal gets processed by the limbic system. And if the limbic system registers that signal or tinnitus as annoying, your autonomic nervous system will get stimulated. And when that happens, it could create your heart to beat faster, it can have your blood pressure rise, and some of these kind of automatic fight or flight symptoms can potentially cause a feeling of anxiety. And the increased attention from your brain on that tinnitus can make it more loud, more bothersome, and can give you more anxiety. So it's like what we like to call a vicious cycle of tinnitus. So we've talked for a little bit about what tinnitus is, what the potential causes are, but I'm sure you're all wondering well, what's the cure? How do I treat my tinnitus? If you do a quick Google search for what cures tinnitus, you're gonna get a bunch of different supplements or drops or remedies that will absolutely 100% without a doubt cure tinnitus. Unfortunately, there is no medication that will cure tinnitus. And there's not really a recommended over-the-counter product for tinnitus treatment. Research has looked into these proposed treatments and supplements, and they haven't really found them any more effective than doing nothing. So I really want to urge you to be cautious of all the advertisements that you see and all of the pills and remedies that you might see on the shelf at the grocery store. It's just somebody trying to sell you something. There might be antidotes and you're not really sure. You wanna make sure that although there's no cure for tinnitus, there's a lot that we can do to manage it because it's not a cause, it's a symptom. And we wanna treat the symptom to help alleviate the cause or the disease. You can go ahead and thank you. The American Academy of Otolaryngology created clinical guidelines for managing tinnitus, and it's to help clinicians recommend different managing strategies. These guidelines recommend educating your patients about different management strategies, recommending hearing aid evaluation if a patient has both bothersome tinnitus and known hearing loss, and also to recommend cognitive behavioral therapy which I'll explain a little bit more in a few slides. These guidelines also go through different supposed treatment options for tinnitus that they don't recommend. So not only do they give clinicians things to recommend their patient, 
they specifically recommend against these other treatments on the right-hand side. They're recommended against because there's a lack of evidence base for the treatment options. But let's talk about what the evidence-based treatment options look like. Our clinic prides ourselves on using evidence-based treatment options to help manage changes. As audiologists, we're always recommending sound enrichment therapy, like using hearing aids or tinnitus maskers, playing music in the background, using sound generators, maybe listening to audiobooks or podcasts. There's also cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, relaxation therapy, exercise. You can go to counseling or support groups for tinnitus. And of course, we always urge people to wear hearing protection to protect your ears from loud noises. And the best way to treat your tinnitus and use these management strategies is to use them in combination. One may work, but two may work better. Any sound that's added to your daily routine, either by hearing aids or using a sound generator, is gonna help stimulate the auditory system and help distract your brain from focusing only on the tinnitus. We're basically turning that light on, like Dr. Whitson discussed earlier. We're minimizing the brightness of the candle by allowing extra sound into our environment. We're disrupting the hyperactive neural firing that can potentially lead to a reduction in tinnitus perception. In 2011, there was a study that showed 34% of patients who reported a substantial relief in tinnitus by just wearing hearing aids. To me, 34% seems a little bit low. A lot of patients that come in say that their tinnitus is either reduced significantly or gone while they're wearing their hearing aids. Of course, most patients that I see have tinnitus on the milder side, but clinically, I think in our office, it's closer to 80% of patients who find a relief with their tinnitus when they're wearing their hearing aids. Some hearing aids also have the option to add a tinnitus masker that will be shaped to your pitch and your loudness for your specific tinnitus. And it can be programmed by an audiologist once you've had your comprehensive tinnitus evaluation. Right here are three different tinnitus apps our clinic usually recommends. Although there are hundreds of different apps out there that will help add background noise and enrich your environment with more sound. Now I've brought up cognitive behavioral therapy a few times now, and it's an effective treatment option to help someone break the vicious cycle of tinnitus I was talking about. It's extremely well-researched and can be used in many different psychological or neurological ailments, not just tinnitus alone. And it can be effectively used to help manage your tinnitus by focusing on interrupting the cycle and redirecting your thoughts from the tinnitus to try and help reduce the negative emotional response that your tinnitus creates. So what should I do about my tinnitus? Discuss your tinnitus with your doctor and you should get evaluated by an audiologist if you think that it is bothersome enough. Consider using sound generating devices like an app or a fan. Um, if you have hearing aids, hearing aids work great to help reduce the tinnitus and enrich your environment with sound. And always remember that you're in control of breaking that vicious cycle. It's the way that we're thinking about tinnitus that causes the stress and anxiety. And I know it's very easy, very easy to say, um, but try to decrease the amount of stress that is in your life. But like I said, easier said than done. <laughs> if you do decide that you want to be evaluated for your tinnitus, our clinic does have comprehensive tinnitus evaluations that are usually completed by Dr. Nancy McKenna or Dr. Patricia Donson. They're both the audiologists who specialize in tinnitus. And if you wanna make an appointment or have any questions specifically on a tinnitus evaluation, the phone number and email are up there so you can do so.
And if you're looking for any more information that you, we didn't touch upon in this presentation, you can always go to ata.org for more information. So I know we've covered a lot of, today, of tinnitus today, and I wanna make sure that everyone leaves the talk with at least general concepts. So tinnitus is extremely common, and for most people, it's not significant enough or bothersome enough to warrant intervention. And of course, remember tinnitus is a symptom, not a disease itself. We need to help treat the disease or the cause and not just the symptom. When it does become a bigger problem, there are effective strategies that can be employed. And that does include getting a comprehensive tinnitus evaluation if you need one. And since tinnitus is strongly associated with hearing loss, treatment strategies usually involve getting hearing aids and using the sound enrichment therapy. But like I said earlier, a combination of different treatment strategies is always best Using sound enrichment like hearing aids, CBT, stress reduction, it's the best way to approach how to manage your tinnitus for most people. And of course, beware of those advertisements that promise to cure the tinnitus. Although they seem promising, they are false. And if you have questions, talk to your doctor about your tinnitus. You can always ask for a referral for your audiologist if it becomes bothersome or it keeps you from sleeping and you want to have one of those comprehensive tinnitus evaluations. Proper assessment and diagnosis is truly key before figuring out what treatment strategy is best for you. And of course, if you want more information, that ata.org is going to have a plethora of information on hearing loss and tinnitus. So at this point, we'll break for questions. Um, I am going to stop the YouTube recording so we can take questions in our live chat. So for those of you joining us on YouTube, thank you for watching. Please like this video, subscribe to our channel. And if you have any comments, please write them in the comment section below.